Okay, so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about prayer. Coming up to the, to the Yom Tovim here. Many of us find prayer a challenge or a real meaningful prayer a challenge, right? How can I expect to make it meaningful when I don't understand the words, right? The rabbis wrote the words for me. They tell me when to stand, when to sit, how to do this. Stuff. You know, I have to take a break from my working day to do it. It's structured. It's just, it's not, it, it can lose its connection to our innermost selves, what we're really supposed to, to, to find, how I was supposed to find meaning in it. So my goal tonight is to try to put a little bit of meaning back into the experience. And I'm going to address essential elements of prayer. I'm really going to whittle it down to its sort of existential, you know, meaning and how it's supposed to work in an attempt to get at the root at it. So I'm not really focusing on the established prayers at all or the, or, you know, what we say. Um, I'm going to focus really on deconstructing it a little bit, breaking it down to a little more elemental experience, and then maybe build it up into something that we can each find more meaningful. And it really is going to come down to one word. And if you know the title of my speech, then you'll know what that word is. I've never heard that word before. Really? Yeah. Okay, excellent. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so <clears throat> let's talk for one minute about what the purpose of prayer is. All right, so... Um, we know that prayer is not for Hashem's sake, right? As with all the other mitzvos, Hashem doesn't need our prayers. He doesn't need our, us, he doesn't need the mitzvos, okay? But it's something that we have to, we, we, it's for our sake, right? We do the mitzvos for our sake. So the question is, what am I supposed to get out of it? What is it supposed to do for me, right? So the word tefillah is related to the word tofel, which means to attach or to join right and or to bind together so therefore there's the purpose the ultimate purpose of prayer is for us to make a connection to hashem and this comes from the commandment in the torah the mitzvah uh to serve god with our hearts and the ra and the state the rabbis say what is this service serving god with your heart what is what form does that take and the, the answer is the service of the heart means prayer Okay, so that's what we call avoda shabalev we we say prayer is called avoda shabalev the work that's in the heart or the work of the heart. And <clears throat> Rambam, Maimonides, explains exactly how this service of the heart is supposed to help make that connection that we're supposed to make to Hashem. So he says, quote, we are told to offer up prayers to God in order to establish firmly the true principle that Hashem takes notice of our ways, that he can make them successful if we serve him, or disastrous if we disobey him, that success and failure are not the result of chance or accident. So how does that connection to Hashem happen? It's, come, it's by, through prayer, we come to recognize that Hashem is, cares in, intimately about us, specifically about us, and every aspect of our lives, right? That we are aware of that and th that Hashem affects everything that happens to us, everything that we do. If this is foremost in our minds, then we've made a true connection to Hashem because if we're aware that He cares intimately about me and about what I do and what happens to me, right? Then I, then when I, when I approach Him in prayer and I, I come to Shul on Shabbos, I'm gonna talk to Him. I am talking to a person who I already know is in my life. It's not like I'm coming to daven to somebody that is, is this sort of nameless, faceless deity. It's, it's a, a personal Hashem that I've made a connection with because I know he's in my life. I've, I'm aware of him in my life. <clears throat> so it's a powerful connection we're making. So by having that constant awareness of Hashem in our lives, we are acknowledging our dependence on him, right? For our health, our daily bread, our welfare, and then we become close to him. That's what uh, Rambam says. So H Hashem sort of nudges us, nudges us towards making this connection to him by asking us to pray, right? Because when we call to God and we, we need his help, or I need some money, I need, I, 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 I need health, I, I want my, my kids to be uh, good Torah loving people. So and when I'm calling to him for help, it forges a relationship, right? If you think about your strongest relationships with other human beings, it's uh, the basis of that relationship has to be, or an element of it is, that you are sharing your deepest feelings, your, your fears, your desires, and that's how you form a connection to that, to that other person. So when you share and express your pain, okay, so when we do that with Hashem, we are also connecting to Him very strongly. So how does He help nudge us towards this? How does He make us realize that we need to pray? 
he created the world that is imperfect and has deficiencies, right? He, in other words, created a situation, put us in a situation where we need stuff. I'm not self-sufficient. I don't have everything I want. And <clears throat> we have a lot of um, places, examples in the Torah, uh, proving this point that Hashem created the world uh, it the, created the world in deficiency for the express purpose of nudging us towards him uh, in prayer so for example uh, the first example comes in the early in the uh, in the story of creation it says on the sixth day of creation it says and no tree of the land had grown and no shrubs of the field were existent because no man was there to work the land Right? This is on the sixth day of creation. But it's a little bit odd if you think about it, because on the third day of creation, it said quite clearly, and the earth brought forth grass and trees of fruit. So where was all of this vegetation on the sixth day? It had been created on the third day, but it's missing on the sixth day. Okay, Rashi explains, quote, since there was no man yet to appreciate, appreciate the need for rain, Hashem held the grass and trees under the surface of the ground until man came, prayed for rain, and then it rained and they pushed forth out of the ground. So it's really a profound concept to think about, right? Hashem had intended all along for Adam and Chava to enjoy the vegetation of the earth, right? But he wanted them to turn to him and to ask for it. So he holds it back, they feel the lack, they turn to Hashem, they pray for it, and then he gives them what they need, right? So he creates the need because he wants the relationship with us. Here's another example. In the same story, uh, the, the story of creation, the, the story of the sin, the snake, the nachash, is punished. What's the, what's the punishment of the, of the nachash? Anyone remember? Huh? He crawl, He'd crawl on the ground, and he would, and he would. The food will, your food will be the dust of the earth, right? So you can ask the question: Why is that a punishment? If my, if if the food, if if his food is going to be the dust of the earth, he's going to want for nothing. The snake, right? The commentators tell us that this is a punishment because Hashem is basically saying, I don't want to see you anymore. I am pushing you away. You have everything you need. It's like basically he's saying, here's everything you need. Have a nice life. Now get out of my face. Right? So there was, there was, there was a pushing away. Like when a father, you know, pushes a child away, it's very painful to the child. Right? When the, the, the biggest, when my kids were little, the, still, maybe, maybe for Siva still, but the biggest punishment I could ever, we could eat, ever give them is to say, go away from me now. I don't want to really see you. Oh, that was, that was like, you, you should have seen their reaction. It was, it was mamish. It was gewaldic. It was like, it was like horrifying to them. Their parent doesn't want to hear from them. It's, it's a scary thing. So, um, so that's, that's another example. Another one that we know is that our, our foremothers were all barren. The, the sages say why? Because, uh, because Hashem desires the prayers of righteous people, right? Another example is the man. Hashem gave, brought the man once a day, rather than he could have brought it once a week, he could have brought it once a month, he could have brought it once for the entire journey through the desert. And the rabbis say that he brought it once a day so that, so that B'nai Yisrael would be forced to pray for it. And they give an analogy, the parable of a king who allots his son a certain amount of food just for that day, forcing the son to come back to the king day after day. So the Gemara says, so in this case, it would be, let's say there would be a father of a, a, you know, five or six children, and he would worry, maybe the man won't fall tomorrow, which would force him again, nudge him towards davening Tashem. There's a story, a very cute little story, that is a nice little uh, analogy here, that is said in the name of Rabbi Noach Weinberg, who tells a story about this uh, this guy named Steve who goes off to college, and his parents uh, leaves his, leaves his parents goes off to college. The parents don't hear from him for weeks, and one day the grandfather comes over. Steve's grandfather comes over with this long letter that Steve has written, and says, you know, here, here here's uh, here, Steve wrote me a letter, told me all about his classes. He wrote all about his classwork and his schedule the friends he's meeting and what he's studying and the parents are amazed because they haven't heard word one from Steve in the whole time you know the weeks that that he's been away and they say how did you get this letter from him we haven't heard from him at all the so grandfather says well I wrote Steve a letter in the beginning when, when he went away and um, I asked him to please describe his life at college and then at the end I said 
your loving grandpa, P.S., I've enclosed a check for $100, and I didn't include the check. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yes, Hashem knows what we need, but he wants to hear from us, right? As long as Steve didn't have anything he needed from his parents, there was no need to write them. Once he, once he, he was motivated by that $100, right, to write his grandfather and say, oh, by the way, P.S., you forgot to enclose the check, so then he has a motivation. Um, so Hashem knows what we need, obviously. He knows our hearts. He's giving us those lacks, but he's, he wants the relationship with us. He wants us to turn to him to acknowledge his presence and to realize that he's a source of what we need, not only physically, but also spiritually. Because what goes hand in hand with this idea is, especially when we're coming to this time of year, I hear a lot sometimes that I just, I don't feel like I'm worthy of approaching Hashem because I'm too rotten. I, I, I can't do this, I can't do that. I, 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 I fail in this area, I fail in that area. People feel shame and they feel guilty and they feel like, well, I don't really deserve any of Hashem's goodness. I don't, I don't deserve anything because after all, I, I can't do tshuva because I can't get past A, B, or C. So they feel like it, it's, they're not worthy of, of actually turning to Hashem and asking uh, for his goodness and for his for blessings. So important thing to understand is that spiritual growth doesn't come from guilt. And I'm going to prove to you now with a story from the Torah about how, Hashem, how much Hashem wants us to, to talk to him and to return to him no matter what level we're, we're on. And that's where the word ayaka comes in. Okay? So this is a very powerful story in the Chumash about the, the story of the sin, right? the, the first primal sin where Adam and Chava eat from the tree, right? So it's a very interesting interchange between Hashem and Adam and Chava and the snake, but the snake is sort of uh, uh, secondary here, that is a lesson to us about Hashem's desire for us to engage with him. Okay, so after Adam sinned, he sinned, he ate from the tree, and it says that he, his wife and he and his wife uh, knew they were naked, they were ashamed, and they hid. They hid in the garden. They heard Hashem's voice speaking, and they hide. Now, the rabbis ask, of course, you know, or you could ask the question, he, he knows Hashem sees all. He's the first person on earth. He, you know, Hashem blew life into his mouth. He knows, Hashem knows everything. So why was he hiding? And, of course, the text says that he was, he was ashamed, right? Here he is. Hashem created the entire world just for him and his offspring, right? Hashem creates this beautiful garden with everything he could possibly need in it. Fruits, vegetables. He doesn't have to pick up a finger to, to be able to sustain himself. His clothing didn't, was you know, he didn't have to do anything. And Hashem gave him one rule. Don't eat from this tree. And he screwed up. He screwed up the one rule. Hashem gave him one rule and he couldn't do it. He was deeply despairing. He was deeply ashamed. Um, so what does he do? He did what we all do. He hid. He hid from Hashem. He basically exiled himself from Hashem's presence before Hashem exiled him, right? He hid from Hashem because the, the, the Pasuk says he was ashamed. Um, so his initial reflex is to hide from Hashem. To, to, and that's what we do. We retreat. We disengage from Hashem. We, we despair. We feel like we're not worthy. So we don't talk to Hashem. Again, Adam knew that Hashem sees everything, right? Hashem could see him know exactly what happened. But we also know that. Intellectually, we know that as well, right? But we still, we feel we're not worthy to talk to him. So what does Hashem do? Hashem goes into the garden and says, Ayeka, where are you? It's an amazing, amazing little thing here. So now, of course, we have the same question on Hashem, right, as we have on Adam. Hashem knew exactly where Adam was. Hashem knew exactly what had taken place. So why does he ask? Right? What is he trying to get at here? So Rashi explains something amazing. Rashi says, Yo haya hechanhu. Hashem knew where he was, Ella, but he asked anyway, Lichnas imo bidvarim, to enter into conversation with him. All right? Shalo yehe nivhal hashiv, so that Adam wouldn't feel shocked, startled, or afraid to answer him. Im shehu pisom, as if he would have, if Hashem would suddenly come out and punish him, right? If Hashem suddenly said, um, you know, you're punished, get out of the garden, then 
Adam would freeze up, right? And Rashi goes on to say that Hashem uses this sort of language as a sort of opening for discussion in other parts of the Chumash. He asks Kayin the same, where's your brother? He knows where his brother is. Bilam, he does the same thing. So notice, Rashi does, explains that Hashem is going to punish Adam, right? Adam is not getting out of punishment, right? However, and, and Hashem could have simply punished him and said, that's it, exiled into the garden, no discussion, right? You're exiled, go to your room, you did this, you know what you did, go think about it, right? We say to our kids very often, go to your room, think about what you've done. I don't want to hear it, end of discussion, I don't want discussion. We're not interested in engaging with our kids at that point, why? Because I know, we know our kids are going to argue on this and argue on that, they suddenly become the best logicians in arguing with us, right? And we don't want to hear it. We don't, we want them to just listen, to just, you know, we don't want to argue back and forth. We just want them to listen to us. Here, Adam commits the primal sin, the one rule that Hashem gave him. And the first thing Hashem wants from him is to engage in conversation. Not only that, but he does it gently, right? He could have said, as we tend as we, as parents, we tend to do. He said, could have, you know, come down here right now. I want to talk to you, right? But he says, what does he say? Where are you? Meaning, come on out. I know you're hiding. Come on. I want to speak to you. I want to see you. I want you to tell me what's going on with you. He opens the dialogue. So he wants us. This is a lesson to us. He wants us to forge that relationship with him. All right. Hashem himself is, is searching out Adam, right? He's hidden, who's hidden himself from God, right? He hasn't banished, God hasn't banished him yet in the garden, but he's banished himself. But Hashem doesn't want us to turn away from him. Now, I want to just go through the text very briefly. I'm going to do it in English and real quickly and see what the interchange is like, okay? So he, uh, Adam hides. Hashem calls out to man and said to him, where are you? And Adam responds, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I'm naked, so I hid. What does Hashem say? Hashem says, who told you that you're naked? <laughs> right? Have you eaten of the tree? And this, this Rashi says is spoken and it should be spoken in a, like, how can you possibly? Have you eaten of the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? Did you do this? Right? Again, he knows <laughs> full well. We do, we do kind of similar things sometimes as parents, right? Did you do this? What did you do, right? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, right? She he right away blames Chava. She gave me the tree and I ate. And Hashem said, said to the woman, what is this that you have done? So again, a more gentler way of saying it. What have you done? Or depending on the tone of voice, I guess, actually, the commentary say it wasn't so gentle. It was, what have you done? The woman says, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Okay, so that's the, a little bit of the conversation there. Huh? Play the blame game. Right, they play the blame game. So, so he's he's obviously he's 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 asking Adam, did you do this? Right? It's it's again it's an obvious question. He knows Adam did it. He knows Adam knows that he knows. You know. Um, so why does Hashem ask that question? Again, I think it goes back to what are we doing when we're asking a, as a parent to a child, what did you do? So let's ha have some feedback. Why is Hashem asking that question? I think in a way you want to know that your child's going to own up to it mm -hmm. and be honest. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You want some, that, that's, that's exactly it. You want, you want uh, accountability. Mm -hmm. Accountability is the first step in what? Shuvah. Bingo. Accountability is the first step in shuvah, right? <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna, I'm going to get back to that in a, little, in a little bit. Let's talk about more about this avodas shabalev that we're supposed to do. What are we actually supposed to do when we pray? So we said uh, the prayer is avodas shabalev, work of the heart. And this phrase really kind of encapsulates everything that we're supposed to put into tefillah, into davening. It has two words, right? Avoda and lev. So there's something, avoda means work or service. There's something hard that we're supposed to do, something difficult. And we're supposed to do it with our lave, with our heart, right? So these two elements, I think, really reflect what's, what's supposed to be going on with, with tefillah. Now, there's two words that we often use for tefillah. One is lehit palel, to daven, to do tefillah. Lehit palel, and there's another word that sometimes we use, hispodidus. 
And I think these words sort of also reflect these two themes of prayer, the, the avoda and the lave. The hispodidus is the hard part. Hispodidus means we pour out our heart to Hashem. Right? This is coming to Hashem in pain, in suffering, in need, in anguish, in love, in joy, in happiness. Whenever there is something deep and dis or disturbing or painful that we have in our heart, we need to share it with them. So it means your kishkas, your insides, you share with Hashem. Right? And, and it's, it's sometimes a challenge because we, we don't always, it's not so easy always to imagine that he's there listening to us and is there, you know, listening as a father or as a friend. We have to try to concretize Hashem in that manner. So that's the, that's the, the lave part of, of, of Oda Shabbale, right? We share our reality with him. We make our heart his heart. Right? We make our reality his reality. So when your heart bursts in pain, you pour it out to him. When you're yearning, when you're broken, when you're empty, you ask him, always ask him to help you through it or help you fill it or fill that lack. Um, and this isn't so always so easy. It's really not always so easy because sometimes we just, it's, it's hard to, to do it. Sometimes there's a story from Aish, from Aish.com of um, a kid in yeshiva that... Um, he just didn't feel like davening. And he went over to his rabbi and he said, Rabbi, you know, I just don't feel like I'm not in the mood to daven. I'm not in the mood and I, um, I just, I can't find any meaning in the words. And I'm also upset because there was a terrorist bombing in Israel and I'm kind of angry at Hashem. How could he let such things happen? The rabbi said, tell Hashem exactly what you told me. Say, tell him, I can't find meaning in these words. Tell him, I can't, I, I, I can't do it because I'm, I'm just blocked. The kid came back an hour later and said it was the most meaningful prayer he'd ever had. He just told Hashem exactly that. He shared whatever was on his heart and it was incredibly meaningful because that's what Hashem wants out of us, just to connect to him in that way. So that's the lave part. Okay, that's the, that's the, uh, the heart part, putting our heart into it. That's one element of prayer. But then there's the other one, which is the avoda. The work part. So why is it such work? What's the work part of, uh, of Avodah Salev? So doing something like this student did, right, is also not so easy because you're opening yourself up. You're basically making yourself vulnerable. Anytime you share something that's really uh, part of your insides, it's your, you're turning to Hashem in need, in need or in pain. You're basically, you know, admitting you're weak, right? You're basically admitting I need something that I can't I can't fulfill. You're admitting imperfection. You know, you're, you're admitting you're not master of your universe. That's work. That's work. So now let's go back to the story of Ayeka. Okay. So there's something else about what Hashem is asking Adam that really relates to the work of prayer. Okay. What is Hashem asking him when he asks, where are you? All right. So we said that it means that he's trying to flush him out of the bush. Come to me, trying to bring him back saying, I don't want to, I don't want you to hide from me. Right. Okay. Let's go back to the text a minute. Hashem says, "Who?" Uh, Hashem uh, says, "Where are you?" Adam says, "I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I'm naked, so I hid." Hashem says, "Who told you that you are naked? Have you eaten of the tree from which I commanded you not to eat?" The man says, "The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate." Hashem says, "God says to the woman, what is this you have done?" The woman says, "The serpent uh, deceived me, and I ate." Okay, so Hashem is asking again, as we mentioned before. Hashem says, "What did you do?" What did you do? Right? Yeah. Adam responded, um, I heard your voice and, and I hid. But did Hashem speak before that? Yes, yes, because it says that. Um, when, he, when he ate of the apple and he realized he was naked and hid, had he at that moment heard Hashem? No, it, um, it says in the previous Pasuk that we didn't cover that they heard the sound of Hashem walking in the garden oh. towards the direction of the sun. Whatever that means, I, I don't know what that means that they heard the sound of Hashem. Towards Do you have an earth? insight as to what that means? Okay. Jewish guilt. Jewish guilt. Towards, <laughs> the garden, towards, huh? no, towards the garden. Huh? Towards the direction of the sun. The, uh, the oh, Ruach no, Hayom. In reality, uh, I said Jewish guilt. I actually saw one of the commentaries that say there's like a certain heaviness and, and guilt that they felt right there that they can feel like, you know, when you're getting in trouble, like right. with your parents or, <laughs> or, or, you know, any type, you know, 
right. all of a sudden you sense, the steps and everything. You sense like, them. Whoa. You sense that presence because of your guilt, right? right? That makes sense, right? Okay. So he says to Adam, "Did you eat? Did you eat of the uh, the thing?" And he asks the the woman. At this point, she's not named Chava yet. He asks the woman, "What did you do?" Right? Because he's he's asking questions, as we said earlier, that he's trying to spark that first step of tshuva. Right? He's asking the question that will help them get started talking about what they did. Um, but you'll note, he doesn't ask a very specific question. He doesn't ask something that I noticed. What doesn't he ask? What doesn't I Yeah. Well, you're on the, on the ball tonight, right? <laughs> he asks, he doesn't ask why. Don't you think, would you, it would be logical to say, why did you do this, right? Why do you think he doesn't ask why? First, they need to admit what they did before they can figure out their motivation. Interestingly, though, they, their admission was, was not a teshuva type of admission. Yeah, I did it, but... Their admission. Me oh, it. Yeah, I did it, but right. it caused me to do it. Right. Not like, oh well, my gosh, I did it and I really regret it. Right. I'm so sorry, I didn't listen to you. you know, right. None of that. Right. So it's interesting that you say that because Hashem asks... Did you, have you eaten, did you eat, right? Now, but Adam's answer to Hashem is not the answer, that, he, that then not, it's not an answer to the question Hashem asked. He right away shifts the blame. So he's, he's answering the why. He's not answering the what. Uh -huh. He's not answering the why, uh -huh. right? He's not answering the why, which is, which is I, not, I he's think. He's not answering what. He's not answering what. He's answering why, right? I have to just put as an aside, say that the woman is a little bit better than him in this situation because what does she answer? Hashem says to the woman, what is this that you have done? So again, asking what, not why. And the woman said, okay, the serpent deceived me. So she's shifting blade, but then she says, and I ate. So she at least is the one who's starting on that road to tshuva before Adam is. She's admitting, she's admitting, he's not. So he's answering, he's not, he's answering the why, but Hashem didn't ask why. Why doesn't Hashem ask why? It's really, well, I don't know, I, any thoughts on this? Because I have, yeah. It's not important. I think it's very important. Is it? Um, uh, maybe two reasons. Number one, uh, it might embarrass them more than there already are. Number two, it, it would create a distance between Hashem and them, that's not what Hashem wants. Hmm. How would it create a distance? Um, if they had to really, at that point, face their motives, they might feel even farther away from Hashem. Mm. They might withdraw. Mm -hmm. They might just be more unreachable. Mm. The heart, mm. their heart might be more unreachable. I hear, I hear. You wanted to say something? I was going to suggest something, but the reality, the way Adam is supposed to Eve answer the question, really doesn't help that. <laughs> I was going to say, if you attack on the fence of why did you do that? So most kids would yell back at their parents, I you know, and defend themselves in that situation. So from a parenting technique, instead, the, uh, it was more of a, where are you? It wasn't direct. It was more of to get them out to in the open and just have, have a dialogue. Right. The only problem is, is that Adam as opposed to Eve, still on defensive and making the blame game so it's still the same right technique as Adam was supposed to eat right but as as we said because he's answering a question Hashem didn't ask right he's answering, I'm just answering saying why. if God asks right. the exact same question you get the same result mm -hmm. at least with Adam as opposed to Eve at least well, if I he asked think. why then Adam could have as he does, blames God for the very event. Oh, right. Yeah. God, he's, <laughs> if he says, why did you do it? He said, but God, you gave, mm -hmm. you gave me the woman, mm -hmm. and I thought she was going to, as a helpmate, mm -hmm. so anything she would be for me, would give me, must be good, so you're, it's your fault. What are you blaming me for? So, I'm an innocent bystander here. Right, right so but I'm saying... Doing? So that's why God can't ask why. Well, maybe, uh, all of these answers are, I think, uh, basically uh, in the in the in the in the same uh, in the same parsha here, that they're they're all blockages to the, the steps of tshuva that they have to take. Right. They have to get back to Hashem, uh, a way of uh, you know, deflecting the blame, blaming Hashem himself, um, you know, the guilt, the focusing on the why doesn't get you to this, those steps of tshuva. But, 
just in yeah. general, just, go ahead. just sorry for interrupting. Go um, ahead, yeah. In general, just, just as a parent, I know from my own kids, yeah. or even when I was teaching other things right. also, right. Um, you're, there's a much better dialogue instead of going right on the attack. Why did you do that, right? right? right or whatever. Right, right. Or, right. It, right. It, it doesn't work. Right. And, and instead, there's hostility and Hashem chose an approach which the kid knows in his case being Adam, <laughs> I'm busted, you know. Right. Um, <laughs> right. No question about it. And right. there's, a, there's a dialogue. So if Hashem would have said, I told you not to eat from, you know, and now you're going to die, die, die forever, right? Mm -hmm. Um. That may have even created less of a dialogue as right. it already is. Exactly. Well, so that's just right. my own perspective. I think that's I think that's what it is. I think that's that's why Hashem didn't ask why. Is it because what what can you say to why? What's the ultimate answer when God says why did you do this? There's no answer, right? And I think we also can so, sort of get stuck in our own lives if we ask ourselves, well, why did I die? How, how many times have you done it? Why did I do this? Why did I, why did I eat that stupid cookie? Why did I, you know, why did I sit in front of the TV for, for half an hour? There's no answer to that. What's the answer? That, that my appetites were stronger than Hashem's desires? Oh, you know, and when we ask our kids, what do they, they, they don't know what to say either, you know? Huh? It's true. Right? Kids, why? They don't. They don't know what to say. They can't. They'll. They'll either deflect. I mean, unless it's like a really serious thing, you know, and the kid has some serious. Right. If there are underlying motivations, right. But it doesn't really serve our purposes to focus on. Oh, why? Why is it? Why did I do it? Your brother. Well, he. I mean, first he took the boy. Right. Right. You get nowhere. Right. Exactly. You don't get anywhere. Right. Right. Um, okay. So. So there's really no justification. The the question why really bogs us down. And we can get overwhelmed with a sense of our own guilt and our own hopelessness and our despairs in the bushes. And how can we come out of the bushes when, when there's no answer to why? So Hashem doesn't ask, ask that question. He asks the question of where. Where are we? That's what he wants to know. Now, according to Zohar, he's asking a very interesting question. He's actually asking a very deep spiritual question, not just, not just a physical one of come out and talk to me, but he's asking a spiritual question. So according to the Zohar, the Zohar sees a, a similarity and other um, commentators also do see a similarity between the word ayeka, meaning where are you, and the word echa, uh -huh. Echa. Okay, we all know what Echa means. We're, uh, how? From, the, from uh, the Book of Lamentations, which we read on to Shabbat. Uh, so, uh, the, the Zohar, quote, God called to the human and said, where are you? This is an allusion to the future destruction of the temple for which is cried out, how? And what is really meant is, Ayeka. Where are you, Ka? So, now we have another commentator named Rabbi Where Yosef Ka. I'll explain God. in a second. I'll explain in a second. <laughs> so Rabbi Yosef Gikatia or Gikatila, he explains this and he says that Ka, which is translated usually as here, right, or this or here, it's um, it it can also mean um, it, it's a it's a, a signal to the Shechina, the divine presence. Ka means Hashem's presence. Yay. Okay. <laughs> um, and it gives some examples in the Torah of where ka is used to indicate the divine presence. So here, when the Zohar reads echa as ayya ka, where are you ka, where are you Hashem, it's a question of where was, where's the divine presence after the destruction of the temple. Okay. So, um, so when Hashem is asking Adam ayya ka, ayya ka, where are you, he's also asking where is the real you? Where is the piece of me in you? Where is the divine Adam? Where is that spark? Where is the one? The one, the person who caused the sin is not the real you. I know it. I know it's not the real you. Don't define yourself by the sin. You are not a sinner. Where is that essence? Where's that ka that I put inside you? Find it and then you can return to me. So he's letting Adam know there's still hope, right? It's a beautiful idea. So he's saying, you have a chance to come back to me. So even though Adam has pre-exiled himself before Hashem did, Hashem says, no, I want to know where you are. I want to know where you're holding with me on a spiritual level. And then you come, talk to me about it. Tell me about it. So Ayeka is a message of hope. So we have to start our relationship with Hashem there at Ayeka. Where are we? Where are we on our journey? Hashem wants us to continue on our journey, wants us to find that 
ka, that spark, and he wants us to tell, start by telling him exactly where we are. No matter where that is, can't be worse than Adam, <laughs> right? So it's hard, it's a difficult, but it's really critical for the journey, right? Because if you, you want to know where you're going, but you have to know where you are, right? If I, if I want directions to Chicago, uh, the directions are going to be very different from Google Maps if I'm in LA, where, in which case I'm going due east, or from New York, right? If you punch in an, uh, an address on the GPS, it, it asks you two things. It asks you your address, where you want to go, but then the second thing it asks you that it can't give you the information without knowing is where are you? <laughs> Right, so you need to start. The work of prayer is to start looking at where you are, answering the hard question of where you are. But it also means Hashem wants to know. So don't hide it from Him. He wants us to say honestly where we are in a spiritual journey and what help we need from Him. So this is this is the hard work of Ayeka. All right, um, and this this work is reflected in our word for tefillah. When we say we're going to daven, we say we are. Hit palel, right? So hit palel also has the the root of pilel, meaning to judge. But the word hit palel is a self-reflexive verb. It's we're doing it to ourselves. So what is the work that we're doing to ourselves? We're judging ourselves, right? So the work of prayer is to get us to recognize what we need to work on in ourselves. So here's how prayer works. Basically, you know, we, we always hear that prayer can can change the evil decrees, right? We say at Rosh Hashanah, Tchuvah, 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 Mavir, and Azra, Hagzera. Tchuvah is one of the things that can really change an evil decree. So how does that work? Or do we just dive into Hashem and he just changes his mind because he likes us? Of course, even that he, because he sees that we're serious about Tchuva, that's not how it works, right? We can't really change God with our prayers. So here's how it works. Prayer changes us, right? Because when we do the Ayeka work, when we look hard at ourselves, we analyze, scrutinize, we see what we need work in, we maybe list a couple of things that we could use help in, and then we turn to Hashem and we say, Hashem, I need your help. I need your help in this particular area. Please help me. And it's it's day-to-day -day prayer. And it can, you know, it doesn't, uh, you know, we talk about prayer as being, you know, uh, obviously established and wrote and, and the words are, are, are written for us. But prayer can be just in your own language, in your own time, just stop in the middle of the day, say, Hashem, please help me not eat this cookie. <laughs> or in a spiritual, on a spiritual level, Hashem, please help me be more patient with my kids or be more giving, or be, you know. So that's how it, ha how it works. We look at ourselves, we enumerate the ways we need to work on. And then as we work on ourselves, we change ourselves. And as we change ourselves, we become more worthy of blessings, of Hashem's blessings. And then Hashem acts differently towards us. That's how it happens. So the question is not what I get out of prayer, but what prayer gets out of me. I think Lori puts that in, her, in the bottom of the emails or something like that, right? So there's, a, there's a perfect metaphor, and I'm just going to close with this metaphor, um, a, a metaphor in the Torah, a symbol in Torah for how this actually works. And it goes back to the dream that Yaakov had. The dream he had of the ladder going into Shemaim, standing on the earth, going into heaven, right? So he, the text says that he saw angels of God going up and coming down, right? And the rabbis say that this ladder was a symbol of prayer, that Hashem was actually telling Yaakov, prayer is the ladder that you can, by which you can connect you to me, heaven and earth, okay? Um, the the meat and the sages explained that uh, that the the meaningful words of prayer they the the words of prayer and through the words of prayer the the resolutions and the changes you made to yourself go up right to Shemayim they're transformed into angels right we say that the that the the Zohar talks a lot about about how a mitzvah is transformed into an angel into a malach. And then Hashem sends blessing down in return. This is why the text is very specific to say that Yaakov saw, what did he see? He saw angels going up and then coming down. Does, now, logically, it really should be angels of God coming down and then going up, right? Because angels originate in heaven. But that's what the rabbis are saying, that, that he it was trying to point out that, he, that the, the, they started here. He was first sending up the angels through the prayer, and then Hashem sends blessings down. So by means of the ladder, we're able to 
uh, rise and elevate ourselves. So we have to start with not hiding in the bushes, okay? In our day-to-day -day lives, it's really difficult to do that. But um, Rosh Hashanah especially is a time to try to get out of the bushes and to, uh, to Hashem gives us an opportunity to really ask us, where are we? And hopefully we will, should be Zoha that um, we should be worthy of the blessings that will come when we do the work of Ayeka. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.